that is 240 rupees, uh, sorry, 60 rupees a semester, 60 multiplied by 8, 480 rupees for, for, for my four years of education. We're very thrilled, we go to the Bay Area, we make lots of money and say that, okay, we, we are from IIT. But who subsidizes our education? There are 600 million Indians who buy salt and sugar and rice to vegetable, pay taxes on that, right? 5% tax, 6% sales tax. That goes towards the funding of my education. That is how I got educated in IIT because the poor actually bought salt, sugar, etc., etc. They pay taxes. So, so everything I'm today standing before you, I'm a classic product of subsidy. My father did not pay electricity bill because it was paid by the Steel Authority of India Limited. My IIT education was paid by the poor in India. I went to the US on a fellowship paid by the tax, by the taxpayers of the United States. And I am a classic product of subsidy. And then I go out to make money for myself. Is that ethical? Is that morally right? Right? Is that sustainable development? Now you teach, you have, I'm sure your MBA students, you, on a day-to-day -day basis, you read of case studies, how to scale up, scale up, scale up is the mantra in many of your scale. How, is it a scale up business? Is this business sustainable if it does not scale up? You look at business plans, okay, how, how are you going to grow 20 to 25% on a yearly basis? Oh, subsidies are bad. Subsidies are not right. That's what you study in your classic case studies, right? When you go through an MBA school. But look at it. Look at yourself. Look at what the higher education institutes of this country have actually done. It is all a product of subsidies. And if we so-called the privileged class, why did I go to IIT? I went to IIT because 600 million Indians did not write it. Pure and simple. If 600 million Indians could write it, then I would not have gone to IIT. So is there not an obligation for me to actually serve this, this country or worldwide, anywhere. The poor in Dominican Republic is very similar to the poor elsewhere, whether it's India, Dominican, Vietnam. So, so coming back to issue is, is, there is, there is a, there's a logic that when, when we connect this social, when you talk about social and sustainability and the youth, and particularly we use the word youth, because, because I, I, many of you who will graduate next year or two years from, Please, please, don't make the mistake of classic MBA students or any of uh, your age students do, is just join a job. A job that where you say that I want to make money, fine, that's not, that's not, uh, that's not a bad idea. But the question is, where, how do you make money that is so sustainable, not only for your family, your society, your country, and worldwide for the environment? And that, as a holistic approach, is what the concept that we started in 19... 1993, 94. A little bit of personal history itself I would like to know. My earlier friends, because I joined the industry very early in life, uh, in, in terms of I was the early 20s, and most of my friends in, in 91 were above 60s, and mostly they, were, they used to be called the California hippies. So my wife gets very angry today because I get more invitation to funerals than weddings, uh, because they are all dying or dead. I mean, just to give an example, I just wrote an email to a a friend, just to see whether he was alive, he was, he's 91, and he wrote me back an email which actually shows his age because he's, he wrote me, yes, Harish, I'm, I'm here, I'm writing a book on my experiences in World War II. <laughs> he's the only person who actually I know who met Mahatma Gandhi in 1946. I have another friend who used to be the driver of Martin Luther King and actually told me what was the actual concept of I have a dream, the, the famous speech by Martin Luther King. Another friend who actually showed me the, the parts of Vietnam, he was an American who actually f who went to Vietnam during the American war and, f and actually protested against the Americans and, and actually showed me places of, of uh, where, what happened, how life was. So between these three, three, four, five friends, the only thing I did not learn from them which I was very clear in my IT days was how to grow ganja using solar energy, right? And, <laughs> no offense here. Yeah. And, <laughs> because you know, I mean, I know your professors are here and would like to tell me, you know, you know, in California, I mean, the f initial history of solar energy, I'll just give you an example. It was interesting because initial market for solar energy, people were, where the LTTE, 
in Sri Lanka, Saddam Hussein, the Kashmiri militants, and the ganja growers of California. Why? All these people, because you had the bombings, the Saddam Hussein got bombed, and so he would have solar panels, so nobody could bomb the power plants. The LTTs would actually steal solar panels to actually do missile charging. And, you know, you know in the California was that the, the, the government would actually fly over the houses to see where there is a sudden spike of electricity. There they would know that ganja is being grown. And a solar panel would actually negate that. And that's, these were the markets of, of in the early, early, early 90s and mid 90s. So, so this, that's, the, that's the history I grew up with. I grew up with these guys who actually taught what life was, what sustainability was. I mean, giving to example, my, uh, is that this, the, the guy who's 91, who's 91, when he was 88, he picked, up, picked me up from the airport in Washington, D.C., 88-year-old guy, just remember, 88-year-old guy, takes me to his house, and he's already prepared a bed for me, and says, sleep, Harish, you have come from a long flight. I have two more hours of emailing to do. He's 88. Okay, I crash, I sleep. I, I, early morning at 4.30, I hear a noise, I get up, he's, has his, he's slowly taking his bicycle outside. Oh, I'm sorry, Harish, I disturbed you. Wait, let me go bike and come back. Uh, well, I, I, I have, I mean, if you've stayed in a hostel in IIT, I have no shame of going back to sleep. I then I went back to sleep. I, I, I got up, he had the bread baked. He had baked the bread himself. And the, and the jam, fruit jam, was from fruits that he had grown himself. So the guy, 88-year-old guy, talks about sustainability and actually preaches and practices sustainability to the core. And he, his name is John Narma. My aunt has met him. He's a very cranky old guy. But the question is, these are the guys who actually taught, taught me what life was, what sustainability was, what, what does actually life mean, and how do you, in fact, respect each and every human being. I mean, just, I mean, just telling about our hierarchy. I mean, I, I'll tie it all into this. I mean, if some people are confused, how does it actually come to these three buzzwords? Is social sustainability or social entrepreneurship actually does not mean that you are actually providing sustainable energy to the poor or you're actually doing something good. It means a whole line. How do you actually treat your employees? How do you treat your partners? How you treat the whole ecosystem around you? For example, we have in our society a very bad habit of calling, oh, my driver will pick me up. I'll start from that. Doesn't the driver have a name? Oh, my maidservant is going to keep it up. My maidservant, doesn't he or she have a name? That's where social entrepreneurship starts. How do you break that barrier? Doesn't the driver, doesn't he have the right to sit here or sit here? Right? When you build up, when you actually graduate from here, please do not, please do not take your degree too seriously. Degree is a piece of paper that you got from here. There are some basics of puzzle pieces that you've got that you take it as, as a foundation, but please don't take it very seriously. Frankly speaking, the, the, it took me four years to unlearn what I learned in IIT. And because I, I mean, not that I, did, I learned anything in IIT, <laughs> but, but is, is, is the, I mean, if, I mean, I don't know how many of uh, graduates from IIT, and IIT, the classic IIT, I mean, I'll tell you there are two things that happened in IIT to me. In the, when the first, first electrical lab, I did uh, whatever I did, uh, the numbers, and next, next, uh, next lab you go in and you have a Viva Voci. The, the professor looks at it and takes it and throws it out of the window. He said, where did it go? I said, out of the window. He said, follow it. <laughs> and that was my first experience. I mean, that means I had not done it the way he thought it. It was never, it was always like just as your kid would say, teacher has told me, it's such a fixed fixed. And in the last, in the last year, in the final year, you have something of a viva voci of what have you learned in four years. You can never study for that viva. And forget if you're, even if you study. So, so the first question for me, I was from the energy engineering department. They asked me, what is energy engineering? So I answered that energy, blah, blah, blah. The next seven questions I could not answer because it, I could not understand. Forget it went over my head. The eighth question was, what's your name? I said, Harish, they all clapped, at last a right answer, <laughs> right? And then, then was, they asked me, they said, do you know the cream of the nation comes here? I said, yes, why are you here? 
right? But, but the fact was exactly why was I here? I could draw an equation, I could draw a car, I could draw the thermodynamics of how a car runs. You show me a car, I will run away. I had no knowledge of what practicality was. I had no, when, I mean, there's a class, if you, uh, there's a lady, uh, co friend from the, from IIT Kharagpur, that's something written in the service of the nation, right in front of IIT, right? So we always joke, which nation? Right. Which nation is it for? Because you're not taught practical stuff. You are in a cocoon. You are, you, you take your degree so seriously, you, when you come out, you actually don't know what real India is. You don't know what the real, India's problems are. You don't know what the real solutions are. You only know how to actually do a Laplace theorem or a, or a, or a thermodynamic equation and, and everything else you can do, but you can actually not solve an actual problem or an issue which is on the ground level. And that's why I say many of the IITNs run away from this country and go to the United States. It's not because there's more opportunities, it's because you cannot solve the problems of this country. That's the easiest thing to do is run away. And that's what most of my friends have done. And the question is, today India is, is at a classic, as a, as a classic place where you and me, we can create solutions with this country. No other country today offers that opportunity. Both of social entrepreneurs, sustainable energy, and the youth. Today, I'll tell you why. Today, you tell me which developing country, which developing country has 40,000 banks in rural India? No other developing country has. We are a paradox. We are a paradox of, a con of an overdeveloped and an underdeveloped country. We, we, today you call up from a village in Bihar of a technology to Bangalore, you can actually get that technology. You cannot get it in Africa. You cannot get it in Latin America. The, there are four billion poor people in the world, most of them who live in India. The, the solutions what you read in case studies of Walmart and Starbucks are not going to solve the business models for the poor. In India needs a paradigm shift in thinking process of business models. And what I mean by business models is a combination of innovation in technology, innovation in processes, innovation in market linkages, innovation in financial models, holistically a different business model that is actually required for the poor. And that's why I've been always at loggerheads with CK Prahlad, even right when God bless his soul, but when he was alive, used to have, I thought the book he wrote, Bottom of the Pyramid, was the most vulgar book. Why? Because that actually showed the rural, that actually talked about the rural or the poor as market. You and me don't like ourselves to be called as markets. There's a difference between needs and wants. A, there's a market for wants. That's a lot of the poor actually are in the sector of needs. We have not created a business model for the needs. And that's where social entrepreneurship comes into place, is how can we spend more time with the poor? In fact, to look at a paradigm shift in the, business, in the technology innovations of what the needs are, with the clean water, clean electricity, clean cooking, et cetera, et cetera. Different financial models. The poor have different financial cash flows. The poor Panipuri vendor that you buy or you eat Panipuri from has a daily cash flow. The Paidi farmer right 10 kilometers away from Manipal has a cash flow on a yearly basis. The peanut farmer has twice a year, a sugarcane farmer at thrice a year, a school teacher every month. Everybody needs different financial products. So you might have a fantastic technology. If you do not have a good financial product, you, the technology at the doorstep of the end user will not make sense. So we as Indians need to create a paradigm shift of how do you create business models for the poor that is, say for example, if you map out India, if you map out India today, and you look at parts of Orissa, which will map, map the human HDI, the human development index of Chad, of Sudan, parts of MP are actually worse than Sudan. So in this, this country, it has, you have an opportunity to create those models, the social entrepreneurship models, which then can be replicated in Africa and Latin America. We can be the center, we can be the center of innovation. Let China be the center of innovation for manufacturing. We be the center of innovation of business models. We can be the superpower of innovation, not the hard superpower that a lot of us are talking about in terms of nuclear, how do we show the West. No, that doesn't make sense because the one billion people in the West already have solutions. We can be the beacon of light for the four billion. Whatever we do in this country today, whether you take a model in Karnataka, whether you take a model in Maharashtra, whether you take a model in Orissa, are absolutely something that can be replicated in Latin America and Africa. Don't you think we should be leaders of four billion people today and become that soft papa rather than creating 
trying to re refocus the business models that the Starbucks and the, and, the, and the Walmarts and everything and the McDonald's and trying to push it into the poor sections and saying that that's the classic model of scalability. That's not going to not work. That's not going, that's, that's a very unsustainable way of looking at the development of this country because the primary mistake when we do of case studies and telling that this is going to be a scale up, we do not realize that the poor in this country is not a monolithic structure. The poor in Karnataka behave very different to the poor in Orissa, to the very different to the poor in Tripura, very different to the poor in Uttar Pradesh. Our needs of the poor in Uttar Pradesh is very, very different to what, it's a very typical example, right? This is, this is, uh, a friend of mine who got, um, again, this is a, I apology to the, to the, uh, to the professors here that uh, IIT Kharagpur was well known for ragging. And we said ragging was banned, but orientation was not. Uh, so we called it, so we called it the orientation. We all got oriented. And I had a colleague of mine who's from IIT Madras and his, his first classic question was, are you an average Indian, below average Indian or above average Indian? The guy said, sir, average Indian. Are, are, you have graduated from two, you have, you have graduated the IIT entrance exam, tell you're an above average. No, sir, I'm an average Indian. He said, an average Indian can milk a cow. Can you milk a cow? And there were two seniors behind who actually got a cow and put it in front of him. An average Indian can milk a cow, now milk the cow. So write a letter to the director of the institute that you're not an average Indian, you're below average Indian. And the two seniors then showed him how to milk a cow. Right? And, and prove that's India. Mind you, that's India. An average Indian, if you look at, you guys are all statistics heroes and MBAs and X number of sales growth. An average Indian can milk a cow. How many of you can milk a cow? That's India. How many actually have seen milking a cow? Forget now. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> and did you drink it? <laughs> so question is, the, you know, in Karnataka, the milking of the cow happens in the morning and in Maharashtra, it happens in the evening. You need different needs. You need different products. You different, different lighting needs are different. You cannot classically take a Walmart or a Reliance model and say, I'm going to create a four light system which is equivalent to what is needed or how do you scale up? I mean, typical business plan which actually come to my desk, I say, I'm going to grow at 20%, 25% right across Maharashtra. Hey boss. And now, I mean, and especially you get more friends now after you win the, win the award, right? And there are now this head of rural marketing, and I hope you guys don't become that head of rural marketing without having rural experience. Now there are head of rural marketing of a lot of, soft, of uh, soft drinks and everything coming to our office. I said, where did you get the experience of rural marketing? I mean, mind you, from, I mean, sorry for asking, Oh, I have read the bottom of the pyramid. I have read three books. Was how many times oh, I have gone to this rural area for a week? I said after 17 years, I have no clue about what rural India is. And you, within a week, are able to do it. And I was not being arrogant. I was just being practical, trying to say, saying, boss, rural India is much more complex. Don't just today. Today you will classically read. Five, there's a five trillion dollar market at the bottom of the pyramid. That's a classic number everybody talks about. Five trillion dollar market, right? It's a non-expendable income. And you classically must have read the, how many of you read the case study of Hindustan Lever, that one rupee shampoo being a classic marketing strategy, right? What happens there? The one rupee shampoo is basically taking that one rupee non-expendable income. The rupee that should have gone into creating assets has now got into creating of our spent in non-asset money, right? A shampoo is not creating assets. So you have actually made the $5 trillion actually smaller. Where did the money go? To the shareholders. You have actually increased the shareholders kitty. You have decreased the poor. You have not, and we have been criticized. Oh, you have to give the poor a choice. Yes, have you given them a choice of providing cl clean electricity, clean water, clean cooking? And parallelly, are you selling them clean shampoo? Yes, I agree. You are not doing that. You are actually decreasing that fine. And where does social enterprise come in is, are you increasing that five trillion to a six trillion dollar market and actually then taking your profits from that extra one trillion? That's where a social enterprise comes in. Today, we need to create multiples of, 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 so of social enterprises in the country. Secondly, why sustainable energy? Half of India does not have 
have electricity. 70% cook in the rural areas using biomass. Coal and nuclear. We talk about coal and nuclear. Coal is cheap. But has any money of you gone and seen the coal mines? How many of you actually have gone to Dhanbad, Jharkhand and seen the coal mines? Would you then use that electricity after seeing the coal miners? When Coal India opened up in the stock market, right? We all get thrilled when we join a software industry because we get stock options. When Coal India went to stock markets, how many of the coal miners were given stock options? Zero. Is that sustainable development? You see, it's the wor second worst condition in India to work is in a coal mine in India. The first being the salt workers of Kutch. Is that sustainable development? Is that cheap? Is that cheap for us at the doorstep where we get electricity while millions of Indians are struggling to actually take the coal out in absolutely pathetic conditions where with no education, no water, no electricity? Is that cheap? We have 32% TND losses. So whatever actually is produced at a centralized level is lost, 32% is lost. We have inefficient industries who actually take so much of inefficiency. Let's first correct those. Let's first correct the efficiency part of this country. Let's part, look at sustainable development. If you actually map out country from Kashmir to Kanyakumari and from Assam to Gujarat, there is an abundance of sustainable energy. You talk about, if, I, if, if somebody goes to Gujarat, I would say it's a mix of solar and biogas. Peak